some extraordinary survivors. A few years ago, turtles like these faced extinction. Their eggs were the favorite food of local people, and only a few were allowed to hatch. Today, they're protected in sanctuaries like this, and hundreds of thousands of them have been able to grow to safety before being released back into the Indian Ocean. And they're survivors in another sense. Turtles almost like these flourished along with the dinosaurs in prehistoric times. As you can see, the turtles are still with us, but the dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. No one knows why. It's the biggest whodunit of all time, and rival teams of scientists have been trying to find the murder weapon. In this remote country, the badlands of Montana and North Dakota, the Hell Creek rocks are the pages of an open book for dinosaur hunters and paleontologists like Kirk Johnson. Within these rocks lie clues to the Earth's history and, Johnson believes, to the extinction of the dinosaurs. It going, guys? It's here among the fossils that he hopes to find the answer in the bones of the dinosaurs and in the now petrified leaves that they ate. Now that's a spectacular example of one of the two lobe leaves, Liridendrides bradicae, which is the most common species at this locality. Let's see what we have here. See the bones sticking right out the top here? A vertebrae of one of the dinosaurs. You see it's cracking up already. If we leave it here, it's just gonna weather, weather out. So we'll pull it out and take it back to the museum. Let me just lift it right off. There it is. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that. Yeah, so we'll get a jacket on here in a second. But there you've got the backbone of a hadrosaur, it looks like. That's incredible. And these are the beasts that did not survive the end of the Cretaceous. Johnson believes that, amazingly, the date of the dinosaur's death is written on the landscape. Fossil hunters had noticed that, at a certain level on the hillside, the fossils ran out. When they looked closer, they found a strange, narrow line. They realized this marked the division between the age of the living dinosaurs, the Cretaceous, and the first era after their death, the tertiary. Even closer analysis revealed that this line contained iridium, a substance normally never found on the surface of the Earth. Right here is the boundary between the Cretaceous period and the tertiary period. That is to say, the rocks that were deposited as sediments above this layer were deposited after 65 million years ago. The rocks that are deposited as sediment before this layer were deposited before 65 million years ago. So if I want to find dinosaur fossils, I go down the hill from where I am now into lower layers, into the older rocks. If I want to look at fossils that were formed from animals that were alive after the extinction of the dinosaurs, I go up the hill. So it's a matter of walking up the hill and down the hill, up through time and back through time. The iridium layer was first discovered in 1979 or 80 by Walter and Louis Alvarez in Italy, and they did further study and found the layer again in New Zealand and also in Denmark. Since that time, the iridium layer has been found at more than 150 sites around the world. The scientists were baffled to find so much iridium in such a thin line all over the world. Some believed they knew where it came from. It had to have been brought from outer space. The source must have been a gigantic meteorite colliding with the Earth. In the scenario of the asteroid impact, we suspect something like this. Within uh, hours, the rebound of the asteroid impact has spread a cloud of dust up into the upper atmosphere, blocking the sunlight from striking the Earth. Over a period of months, the plants will cease getting sunlight and will die, and the animals that rely on the plants, such as the large herbivorous dinosaurs, will have no uh, reliable food source. So the large animals die. The animals that are supported by these herbivorous dinosaurs, like the large carnivorous Tyrannosaurus rex, similarly will succumb to a lack of food or other direct environmental effects of the asteroid impact. The fact that we see huge levels of extinction of plants at this level, as represented by the disappearance of plant pollen and the disappearance of many species of plant leaves, and the fact that dinosaur bones are only found below the level suggests to me very strongly that the asteroid 
impact and its resulting fallout ash layer were the direct cause for the extinction of the dinosaurs. The meteorite theory was first advanced in 1980, but unknown to the scientists, the evidence to support it had been found years before. A geologist was prospecting for oil and gas off the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Using a magnetometer slung under a helicopter, Dr. Glenn Penfield was carrying out surveys of the Earth's magnetic field. We were looking for small excursions or, or anomalies, areas in the Earth's magnetic field that are out of the ordinary, uh, that are not from the simple predicted model uh, of the overall Earth magnetic field. So we take those measurements that would be taken uh, every uh, one second, say, and recorded on tape and on paper, and then we could make a profile of those, we could make a map of them, and we could see what the Earth's magnetic field looked like, and by interpretation, what is underneath the surface. This is the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, and it was in this area that I first noticed these uh, extraordinary anomalies. We were flying east-west lines about 400 kilometers long, uh, first in the offshore and then in the onshore portion uh, of the platform. I started to see when we were uh, oh, 100 kilometers or so uh, off the coast a pattern of very small, uh, irregular, high-frequency excursions in the field, which looked just like noise. They looked just like the sort of thing that we reject data for, a uh, possible solar disturbance or something. Suddenly, I began to see anomalies that were much shorter, very quick reversals in the Earth's magnetic field. The form of a, of a half a bullseye began to emerge. Penfield compared his findings with another map which measured the density of the rocks below the surface of the Yucatan. It confirmed that the half bullseye was the rim of a gigantic crater. So deep beneath the earth, it had lain undiscovered for millions of years. When I put the two maps together, uh, there was uh, uh, just uh, uh, one of those aha moments. I suddenly saw this and saw a, a feature uh, 230 kilometers across with a high degree of symmetry and uh, unlike anything I'd ever seen in my either my academic training or my professional work. And I, I suddenly knew, I looked at that and I knew that this was the, uh, the signature of a, of a meteor crater. Now, scientists like Luis Marin from the National University of Mexico are trying to discover just how big the crater was. At Chixcalub in the Yucatan Peninsula, Marin is using deep drilling rigs to bring rock cores from below the Earth's surface, where he thinks evidence of the crater may lie. The question of the size is very important in terms of the energy released. If the crater is on the order of 300 kilometers, we probably can tie this in to the extinction of the dinosaurs. The energy released at the moment of the impact is greater than the nuclear arsenal we have worldwide. It would be as if a billion nuclear bombs, like the one in Hiroshima, were exploded instantaneously. We'd have a huge fireball that would have come out, and then slowly things uh, would have cooled down. Marin bases this estimate on the explosive energy needed to make a crater so vast. And his core samples show that when the meteorite struck, it crashed through the sea into limestone. The geology of Yucatan is, is unique. There was no worse place that could have been hit by this meteorite. And it's perhaps the worst environmental catastrophe the planet has experienced. Some of the possible effects due to the vaporization of this rock include acid rain. It includes sending enormous dust clouds into the atmosphere. We're looking for the impact debris. In other words, the material that resulted after the impact. This is a sample that we have, and this is what's left of the meteorite. It was in a sample such as this that we found the evidence that convinced the scientific community that Chicxulú was an impact structure. What we have here is after the meteorite or comet hit the Earth, it produced molten rock 
to, to the speed at which it hit the earth. And then very quickly, remember we're in water, it's, it, it turned into rock. This produces glasses and impact rock, which is what we see here. The other pieces we see here are pieces of the basement, pieces of the material way below that were ripped apart due to the collision. And this is what we want. Once Marin finds out how deeply the rocks blasted by the meteorite lie, he can reconstruct the exact shape of the crater. And his discoveries so far have convinced him that the Chicxulub impact could have wiped out the dinosaurs. We have on the one hand a one in a billion chance of having an impact hitting the earth. And at the same time, we have whole species being wiped out, including the dinosaurs. In my mind, there's no question that Chicxulub is, was the cause of the demise of the dinosaurs. But some paleontologists don't agree that dinosaurs were wiped out suddenly. They claim that they died out over a long period. This man, Peter Sheehan of the Public Museum in Milwaukee, is putting that theory to the test. He organized a team of excavators to comb the outcrops in the Badlands. The dinosaur bones they found there would either confirm the theory of a gradual extinction or would point to a sudden death. What we were trying to do is set up an ecologic study, model after modern environments. And when modern environments uh, are under stress, we find that the communities change slowly. And the, the relative proportions of animals in those communities, some animals become more common, other animals become less common when there's a stressed environment. So if the animals in the Hell Creek Formation were dying out gradually, we would expect to find changes in the relative proportions of dinosaurs in those communities. At Hell Creek, Sheehan's team dug at three different levels in the rock. This covered a time span of two million years. If the dinosaurs had been dying out gradually, the bones would have shown changes. There are about eight families of different kinds of dinosaurs that have been found in the Hell Creek. The most common family is the group of ceratopsians, including Triceratops and Horosaur. These are animals with large shields and frills on the back of their head. They were herbivores, plant eaters. Uh, they had a large horn on the front of their uh, skull. These were the most common dinosaurs in the lower, middle, and upper. They were always the most common. More than half of, the, of the, all the fossils we found belonged to the ceratopsians. The next most common group were the hadrosaurs. Hadrosaurs are duck-billed dinosaurs. They're also plant eaters. The most abundant meat eater was Tyrannosaurus, the largest meat eater of all time. This is a vertebra of a, of a Tyrannosaurid. A smaller uh, meat eater were the dromaeosaurs. Dromaeosaurs are clawed animals, still carnivores, but uh, they have nice claws related to their meat-eating abilities. And they were always a lesser animal in importance. When his fossil hunters had finished, Sheehan found no signs of a community under stress. Throughout those two million years, the dinosaur population was stable. There was no evidence that doom had been approaching over a long period of time. It seems to have been a very abrupt extinction, and it totally wiped out the largest life form on the surface of the Earth and gave rise to a completely new set of communities. I find the giant meteorite theory convincing, but then I'm biased because it was first proposed in 1980 by my good friend Louis Olvers. He was a Nobel Prize winner and one of the great scientists of his generation. Louis and his geologist son Walter called this meteorite impact the greatest catastrophe in the history of the Earth. Until, of course, the next one, because sooner or later something similar will happen again. But some scientists have other theories about the extinction of the dinosaurs. They blame disease, volcanic eruptions, drastic climate change, the wholesale destruction of vegetation, and even constipation. All these theories are plausible and are fiercely defended. The world of the dinosaurs was anything but friendly. Paleontologists are trying to reconstruct the creature's environment to see if the picture will yield any clues. What emerges is a far cry from the safe world of theme parks. 
the dinosaur's planet shuddered with volcanic activity and baked beneath relentless sunshine. Its inhabitants struggled to reproduce in large enough numbers to guarantee survival. All dinosaurs were hatched from eggs, and it's in the fossilized eggshells that science now searches for clues. In the field, Professor Heinrich Erben seeks out the places where the dinosaurs nested. There, he finds the fossilized shells which form the basis of his research. Professor Erben is studying the thickness of the shells. He believes they became so thin that not enough dinosaurs could hatch out. What caused the thinning of the eggshells is, of course, a crucial question. We know that the same happens today also in uh, the living birds and in the eggs of living reptiles under certain conditions. We know that the thinning of the eggshells is due to a deficiency of a certain enzyme called carboanhydrase. This is due usually to stress. In the case of the dinosaurs, it appears that very probably a change in the vegetation uh, is responsible. Erben believes that the thinning came with an altered climate and that changes in plant life at the time of the extinction bear him out. From his collection of shell fragments, he's even deduced how the embryos perished. They simply dried out in the heat of the day. If the eggshell is too thin, then there is the danger that uh, there is an excessive evaporation of the inner liquid content of the egg and uh, then the embryo simply dries completely and, of course, uh, perishes. Erben's colleague, Abdul Ashraf, also looks for clues in dinosaur eggshells, but he analyzes their chemical composition. His team grinds them down to powder and puts them through spectrophotometer analysis. This reveals the chemicals present in the air at the time the egg was formed. Any poisonous elements or toxic compounds will show up here. This process, this analysis, we have found uh, many uh, rare elements like vanadium, like uh, iridium, and also other poisons like uh, leads. We can see these things in the eggshells. The rare elements revealed by Ashraf's analysis include poisonous compounds normally only found in volcanoes and meteorites. The toxins come maybe from volcanoes or from uh, asteroids uh, in this time. His verdict? Death by poisoning. The eggshells contain a lethal cocktail of vanadium, iridium and lead strong enough to kill off the species over a period. Whatever wiped out the dinosaurs did not affect their nearest relations. Crocodiles and alligators were also around at the time, and scientists want to discover why they survived when the dinosaurs died. For Professor Mark Ferguson at Manchester University in England, alligator eggs incubated at different temperatures provided a breakthrough. If you incubate eggs at 30 degrees centigrade, for example, a batch of eggs like this, they all turn out to be females. But exactly the same eggs, even from the same clutch incubated at 33 degrees centigrade, give you 100% males. So 30 degrees centigrade, all females, 33, all males. For Ferguson's research team, that discovery was just the beginning. They also found that the temperature at which the eggs were incubated affected more than just the sex of the creature inside. If it's a cool year, then the animals are smaller, they don't eat as much food, they're well adapted. If it's nice warm weather, they grow large, there's plentiful food supply. So they can adapt their metabolic rate and their body size to a changing environment very quickly, in the same generation, in fact. Yeah. Good. Ferguson concluded that unlike crocodiles, dinosaurs could not adapt quickly to change. Because of their more advanced genetic makeup, they had to rely on slow evolution. Now you can't change your growth by going on a sauna for, you know, six months and coming out longer, but an alligator can. 
So what happens is that dinosaurs, because they had these chromosomal-based mechanisms, couldn't adapt quickly to the changing environment. It gets cooler, what happens in alligators and crocodiles, they scale down their metabolic rate, they scale down their maximum body size, they can adapt in a few generations. Dinosaurs, much more highly evolved, much more like us, they have to mutate the genes, have natural selection, it takes thousands and millions of years, so they adapted too slowly and they went extinct. Another survivor, the tortoise, provided researchers with a theory. Dr. Laurie Croft had been working on human eyes to understand cataract blindness. He analyzed proteins from the eyes of different creatures. It was then that clues to a 65 million year mystery stared him in the face. We isolated the proteins from both reptiles and from mammals. And after purifying them and putting them into test tubes, we exposed them both to heat and we exposed them to sunlight. And in fact, we used the roof of the University of Salford uh, and we left it on the roof for two weeks. Two weeks exposure to the sun brought about a dramatic change and suggested a whole new scenario for the dinosaur's extinction. Well, we've had two weeks of sunshine here in Salford and you can see now that the protein from the reptile lens has gone cloudy. The protein from the mammalian lens is clear. Now, this would indicate that reptiles in sunlight are susceptible to cataract. Now, if there was an increase in solar radiation, um, the dinosaurs having this protein, like the reptiles, would have become extinct because of cataract blindness. You can see here that uh, he can retract into his shell and get protection from the sunlight. Now, if you look at the, the, those reptiles that survive the great extinction, the lizards, the snakes, the, the tortoises and the turtles, they can all escape from sunlight. Well, the dinosaurs, of course, being large, couldn't. And having this unstable protein, they would have been much more likely to have had cataract. So uh, the theory is that uh, the dinosaurs became blind due to cataract at an earlier and earlier stage as the temperatures increased. Croft says blindness would have meant disaster. Unable to escape easily from predators or to find food or a mate, the whole species would eventually die out. The dinosaurs would have been doomed. The solution to this fascinating detective story may turn out to be quite complicated. It may indeed be a combination of several theories. In any event, the dinosaurs didn't die out completely. The smart ones became birds.